Life, life is relentless, isn't it? The years start coming and they don't stop coming. Two digits change in the calendar and it leaves us all so devastated that we're dizzy, hungover and in need of a little pick-me-up. Thank God then for the miracle mug of muddy bean water that is coffee, helping us keep up with the furious, unceasing march of time. It's both idea source for the work-shy brain and lubricant for the grinding tedium of social interaction. But coffee is more than just deadline juice. Through the centuries, it's been responsible for stimulating great minds every morning, as well as loosening great bowels slightly later in the morning. Through today's ordinary thing, we'll see that a cup of hot, steaming joe has been brewing in the background of some of history's most pivotal moments. But what is coffee? Coffee is a drink, usually served hot, made from the ground and roasted seeds of the tropical coffea plant. It is the second most traded commodity in the world, beaten only by petroleum. Car source? Thanks to coffee's dirt water delivery system, caffeine is the most consumed drug in the world, with an estimated 500 billion cups gulped down worldwide each year. Today, coffee is grown commercially in over 70 different countries, with Brazil being its chief exporter, flicking its bean into a third of the world's mugs. But where did coffee come from? While the coffee plant has been around for over a thousand years, there is scant record of its liquid consumption until it was grown as a crop by Sufi monks in 15th century Yemen. These monks would pound back jars of java during late night rituals of dance and spiritual communion, meaning that these Islamic mystics not only invented coffee, but also the all night coffee bender. From the Yemeni's coastal town of Mocha, coffee infused itself across the Islamic world. Coffee houses took Istanbul by storm, and they became places where people could freely discuss new ideas, which naturally upset the people who were in charge of the old ideas. In 1511, Mecca attempted to crack down on coffee because it was popular in meetings of political dissidents. And Murad IV of the Ottoman throne would punish frequent drinkers by sewing them up in a bag and throwing them in the sea. But these bans were short-lived. The bean was just too popular and too profitable. And today, the holiest city in Islam is home to nine Starbucks locations. While coffee was enjoyed across Europe in the 17th century, much like the grime at the bottom of a French press, most of it accumulated at the arse end of the continent. Britain. A country that was sorely in need of a drink to sober us all up. Thanks to large metropolitan populations and poor management of municipal water supplies, nearly all available drinking water in Britain was infected by human and animal sewage, meaning the only purified beverages that people had access to were alcoholic. As such, the British of the 17th century had no option but to be drunk, or very drunk, pretty much all the time. So when coffee arrived, along with all its other benefits, it offered a way of purifying water that didn't involve being constantly shit-faced. Coffee changed the nation's drinking habits forever. We went from being an island of problem alcoholics to a country of proud weekend binge drinkers, efficiently fitting a week's worth of drinking into a 48-hour blur of kebab shop brawls and toilet-hugging self-recrimination. God, I'm proud to be British. By the 18th century, there were over 3,000 coffee shops splattered across the British capital. But these shops weren't like the bland bunkers of copy and paste corporate conformity that we know and tolerate today. Each spot had its own unique culture. They were places where strangers could have deep, meaningful conversations, provided they could hear one another over their caffeinated brain static. They became known as penny universities, because they were a place where you could get an education and a cup of coffee for pocket change. Unlike British universities of today, where you shell out nine grand to acquire a piece of paper and a gritty ketamine habit. The ravings of these 18th century coffee junkies gave birth to many great institutions. In the Grecan coffee house in Chelsea, you would find scientists like Isaac Newton discussing the new ideas of the time, as well as dissecting exotic animals on the table. The London Stock Exchange began as a coffee shop on Exchange Alley, making it the first place that financial professionals could sit around and sniff their own brown. But perhaps the coffee shop's most monumental gift to the world was the goddamn United States of America. Following the European model, American coffee houses were full of self-important know-it-alls and therefore became epicenters of radical politics. The Green Dragon coffee house in Boston even became the unofficial headquarters of the American Revolution. And appropriately, it was where the Boston Tea Party was planned. After which, drinking coffee became something of a patriotic act in the States, as it was the best alternative to the heavily taxed tea coming from British importers. Coffee quickly became the nation's drink of choice, 
served with a side order of freedom fries and stirred with the corn syrup of self-determination. In the American Civil War, Union soldiers were given a one-tenth pound of coffee with their daily rations, where it remained scarce among Confederate soldiers, who presumably were off-put by the mixing process. And mayhap this little extra bit of pick-me-up was what gave the Union soldiers that extra bit of pep to enthusiastically bayonet their way to victory. By the 20th century, America was guzzling down over half of the world's coffee, setting the stage for a new conflict, the battle for coffee brand supremacy. The first half of the 20th century saw brands like Maxwell House and Folgers Coffee compete to become the nation's favourite diuretic. Snappy slogans and radio sponsorship became the best way to etch your brand's name into the collective unconscious. But it wasn't really till the 1950s where coffee marketing really picked up steam with the advent of television. Here, coffee companies couldn't just rely on the product's great taste or stimulating properties. They had to connect it to people's deeper desires for intimacy, connection, and to keep their sham marriages from falling apart. Oh, this coffee is criminal! Honey, you killed the petunias! Folgers Coffee dominated the airways with this series of ads which featured a cavalcade of husbands declaring their wives' coffee to be undrinkable dirt water. Your coffee just doesn't taste any good. Want anything special for your birthday? Just a decent cup of coffee. But if you could do one thing for me. What? Try to do something about your coffee. I hoped it would be better today. Their domestic rage only satiated once their spouse had swapped to the Folgers brand. You're kidding. I'm serious. Honey, your coffee's undrinkable. That's pretty harsh. Well, so's your coffee. You know, the girls down at the office make better coffee on their hot plates. Don't push it, mate. Otherwise, that coffee is going to start tasting like fiberglass. In the 1980s, a decade known for its subtlety, Gold Blend made coffee coupley again, with this extremely popular campaign featuring a will-they-won't-they they pair of neighbours who are as horny as they are posh. You saved my life the other night. <laughs> the dinner party. The coffee. Very successful. How can you ever thank me? I'll try and think of something. It was significant because it was one of the first serialised ads that built up the sexual tension each episode for the audiences to blow their collective beans over. Hello. I want to see you. No. This campaign and the litany it's inspired have combined coffee and sexual intimacy in the public imagination. So much so that when Folgers released this viral advert in 2009 about a brother returning home to his sister for the holidays, all anyone could see brewing was some steamy sibling on sibling action. <laughs> what are you doing? You're my present this year. Once again, coffee was ahead of the curve, promoting incest years before it reached mainstream pornographic appeal. Back in the 1980s, though, the coffee industry saw its first decline in sales, partly due to the surging popularity of soda. And so, to maintain growth, the industry had to find a way to get people to pay more for the same product. And a small Seattle-based beanery had the answer. Yes, that's right, Starbucks. The world's premier producer of ground garnish also happens to produce price-gouged coffee-style drinks. The mocha-dusted monolith began as a single store that only sold unground beans. But under the sweaty stewardship of Howard Schultz, the company started spaffing coffee into paper cups too. Schultz built Starbucks into an $80 billion company through a period of aggressive expansion. During the 90s, Starbucks spread like a Veruca virus in a public swimming pool, opening an average of five stores every day. The company's success can be attributed to its ability to add a personal touch, making coffee customizable and suited for each consumer. By inventing the Frappuccino in the mid-90s, Starbucks even invented a coffee for people who don't like coffee, burying all semblance of flavour under a mountain of sugar and Instagram-ready artificial colours. The Frappuccino accounts for 14% of the company's sales, which is a problem because people are progressively aware that it's just three milkshakes in a coffee trench coat. So recently, they've been pushing it out in a large-scale visibility campaign. I wish I was dead. Oh, you mean like your last shred of credibility? Coffee is so damn good that coffee culture attracts a diverse and passionate collection of wankers. So new products and trends are churned out every day to appeal to every demographic imaginable. There's gourmet coffee for the metropolitan butt sniffer who likes to enjoy their coffee with an aperitif 
of their own opinions. There's coffee machines for the refined adult who needs to spend at least three figures on something before they can enjoy it. Like the Nespresso pod piercer here, imbued with class and elegance thanks to their celebrity spokesman, the Kloonster. Or ethically sourced carbon neutral coffee for the consumer activist on the go who can't buy anything until the label validates their beliefs somehow. And then there's latte art, the most popular thing on Instagram that isn't butts, Kylie Jenner or Kylie Jenner's butt. It encourages every Insta thought with a multi-digit first following to decorate their timeline with free advertising, minutes before they presumably decorate the coffee shop toilet with a Jackson Pollock style reinterpretation of their own. And if all this newfangled coffee snobbery makes your head go all shouty, don't worry because Mickey D's have got you sorted, advertising their coffee as the simple, honest alternative to the maddening complexity offered by their competitors. This 2017 advert is a great insight into what McDonald's thinks of their customers. A parade of meat vessels for whom purchasing coffee represents an insurmountable intellectual challenge. McDonald's coffee. Simple. Like you, you cretin. But McDonald's is only saying what we all know deep down. Coffee when it's stripped down and at its most basic is already perfect. It smells good, tastes good, and helps you write YouTube scripts in record time. And it also provides us a lesson. The better a product is at its inception, the more likely companies will try to dilute it and destroy it to make it look like something new. 